is cut before you judge it. Um, the question then for um, the, the question, for, oh sorry, and on Scott's position as well. These are fast moving events, and I should say we're having a debate in Swap about this, and actually trying to get a handle on where Swap should be positioned within, within this changing context. And I think a lot of other institutions are trying to do that. And institutions are made up of individuals with different political positions. I know what mine is and what I'm arguing in that. Other people may be open different, but that's something which is going on at the moment. So there's a politics within institutions as well. We're not homogenous. Um, the question to Joseph. Um, I, I, I thought this was an excellent, uh, this was an excellent presentation. Um, Ikemelen has, has, has a very particular positionality in all of this, a very particular sort of uh, geographical and political location. It's right there, down by Crudel. Um, it's on a piece of land which is, which, is, which is state land. It has a particular history of settlement and occupation and, and development. And the danger could be, this isn't the danger from Joseph, but the danger could be that one then thinks that all of this turbulence is going on in the new informal settlements which have sprung up around the pitheads of the type that Andres was showing us. But the, the turbines, the resistance, the struggles which, which, um, which Joseph were describing, spread right through the areas which are under tribal authorities as well. There is no Chinese wall between them as far as the political sociology of these places is concerned, although it's a political sociology which develops under slightly different conditions. And so this is a plug for you as well, Joseph. Joseph has just come back from also doing field work in, in a village in the Buffer King area, right at the heart of the Impala mining complex in the Buffer King area, Hialuka. And um, Joseph, it would be useful for perhaps if you could share some of your findings from that as well and reflect on how the forms of um, activism and mobilization you found there connect with, but perhaps also differ from the ones you've seen in the neck of Milen. And I would suspect, from what I've heard of your work so far, it's going to be a very different picture to the one which is painted by the posh public schools, the glossy self-promotional brochures, and the overqualified PR offices. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, look at the bigger landscape and how that landscape links to, uh, to different forms of globalizations. The illegal mining in Valcom is very, very global. It's uh, very local, but it's also very local. Um, and, and I do think by raising Valcom in this context, and the fact that 40 workers died in one incident underground, 40 illegal miners, is as much the responsibility of the state as its police force going out and shooting workers. The one is by omission and the other one is by commission. And this raises, I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important point to raise about the fact that in often, often, often cases the state is not doing its job um, by nationalizing a, a, a regulatory regime that's supposed to protect people from exploitation by gangs. Um, and in those cases the state is infiltrated by these gangs. When the police go underground, the work, these illegal miners are gone. Um, yeah, uh, but, yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that. I, I, just a couple of quick responses. I, first of all, to the National Union Mine Workers official. I, I think that's the absolute critical issue, isn't it? Why haven't the same positions of unions here as are held by unions in Australia and by regulators in Australia as regulators here resulted in the same outcomes? That's, that's the challenge. That's the question. And I, I think that it, it, it requires some, some more than just you know, a glib answer. It's actually about looking quite closely at what's going on on mine sites. And uh, in our research, it is around individualism and individual blame, which is not so common in Australia, where in Australia, unions and government, and, I have to, uh, and to a large extent, the industry have focused very much around risk control. What's the source of the risk and how do we control it, rather than finding out whose fault is it and how can we blame them. That happens too in Australia, don't get me wrong. But it's, it's the, the, the overwhelming pressure is to find out what's the risk and how do we control it. We didn't see anywhere near as much of that happening in our investigation here. It was very much around who, who worked in an unsafe area and got themselves injured, therefore it's their fault, therefore we'll discipline them, we'll sack them, we'll do whatever. And there's a, I think there's a lot packed into that that deserves close analysis and to be addressed and shift the focus from individuals to how do we control risk. And that requires hard discussions about technology and mechanisation, which is very challenging for everybody. 
And I think that comes to May's point about coal. That's the big similarity between coal here and coal in Australia. We saw some really horrible coal mines here, though, I have to say, May. It wasn't, it wasn't all as, as, as positive. And there's definitely a difference between open cast and underground. But, um, yeah. And I would not begin as an outsider to make any comments about the political ramifications of Marikana. I leave that for people with much greater understanding of the political scene here than me. Okay, I think I can use this one. Uh, just two things. Firstly, I think uh, to the NUM official, uh, no doubt the introduction of living out allowances was, was really a great development and uh, it alleviated the living conditions of, of workers in a way. And obviously the disbandment of uh, the old compound system was also another positive development. But what I'm more concerned with is uh, what uh, those workers are doing with their living out allowances, okay, and where they are living. Because we find that most of the workers, they take their living out allowances and they stay in the informal settlements. You ask them, why are you staying in the informal settlements when you are being given living out allowances? And they, they tell you that if they get 1,500 as living out, out allowances, they can just use 300 to, as rent in, that, in their mkuku and then they can use the rest of the money for other things. So, I mean, they, 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 are, they are making a decision on what to do with their, with their money. But I think it's, it's an issue that we also need to grapple with. And then to, to Gavin, yeah, obviously, I mean, uh, these protests are, are, are spreading across all the informal settlements and even in rural, in, in rural areas as well. And uh, as, as somebody who was in, in Luka recently, I, I encountered so many narratives about protests uh, against uh, the Royal Buffalo King, just against the mines, cities, uh, etc. And they take kind of this, uh, the same trajectory as, as, as protests in, in Ikimelen. But I think what I can say is the difference is, is to do with land ownership. Who owns the land? Is the, the, the land being owned by the state or is it owned by the tribal authority or is it in private hands? For example, in, Ikim in Ikimelen or Matevelen, which, which depending on, on, on where you're coming from. Uh, in in Kimelen, the, the land is state land, and uh, the, the community is at, at a stage where it, it is now becoming formal. The last time that I was there in, in February, uh, the, the municipality was constructing roads, and, uh, and, and the mayor actually came to address the community and promised that by June this year, uh, 1,000 households would have been connected to electricity. I haven't been there. Uh, I, I don't know whether 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 that that uh, promise was 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 met, um, but if if you go to number nine, number nine settlement, it is the land is, is is in private hands, and although the community is engaged in similar protests, uh, nothing has has come out really. For example, they they once protested and demanded that the municipality supply them with water, and then the municipality I think installed uh, I think three water tanks, but then. Uh, the private person, the, the person who owns the land came and said that the municipality could not do anything without his consent because the land still belonged to him. And then in the case of Luca, it's, the protests revolve around land ownership and the land claims that, 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 that are happening between uh, the people, of, uh, most of the clans in Luca against the Royal Buffalo King. So you find that their protests are both against the Royal Buffalo King and also against um, against the mines. So, so land is really a crucial issue in, in the nature and the trajectory of these uh, community protests take. Thank you very much. Right, we'll do another round. This one right at the back. Two, three, four. Right at the back. Thanks, uh, Anne Mayer from IANRA, the International Alliance on Natural Resources in Africa. Um, okay, I guess my background into getting to sort of doing the work I'm doing now is doing a lot of work um, in learning from communities affected by platinum in Limpopo province. And um, I'm just thinking with Joseph because also having done quite a bit of work, similar, I guess kind of similar type of work. Um, that I know, I'm sure, is in your head as well. But I also wanted to share it. I guess it tags on to what Gavin said. Is, uh, yeah, I think we have to be really careful about how we are making conclusions about what communities are doing. I mean, we have comrades from communities here now. But I think 
that sometimes when we, we, we move from the work we do in research or whatever, and we move to the findings and conclusions, I think there's a, there's a danger that it can be generalized. Um, and I, I think that, I think we need to, when we're reporting, we need to show the nuances very much. And I'm thinking also of your slide that says the dark side, right? Of, of I guess, community protest. Okay, I caution us not to say the dark side, and I caution us um, to be really clear if that is a very, what do you call it, a minority experience, like it's, it's rare, is it, I saw a usually in there. Because um, having worked with a lot of communities, um, actually most of the majority of what I've seen is there's not corruption, but of course there is with some leaders and all of that. So I really, I really want us to be really cautious with these things because I think, especially as people who don't come from these communities where we're working with, we, we can misinterpret. And I'm not saying you are, because I think what you're doing is really awesome, Joseph, so don't take it like funny. But yeah, thanks. So there are two questions. There. Yes. One behind you first. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Timmy. Uh, there are, I've got a bit of a concern with two issues that are, I would like to raise. One, the issue of uh, uh, illegal mining in, uh, in Velgo. And uh, secondly, the issue of uh, the previous speaker has touched a little bit on it. One, we, we have to understand that uh, we, we are all part and parcel into whatever legislation that uh, our government passes. We are also part and parcel to those legislation. And uh, secondly, when we discuss the issue specifically on the topic today in terms of Marikana issue, we, we tend to forget or to look to say, what are the contributory factors? to what we call today Maragana fatal or Maragana uh, killings. We all concentrate in a sense of the end results. What are the contributory factors that cause us today to speak about it? If we tend to forget or we don't go to dig deep deeper in an understanding of the cause for us to be able to talk about it today, it's going to repeat again. I'll make an example. When you take into today, 2030, you go back about uh, 10, 15 years ago, the age of RDOs then, and the percentage then, compared to today, you take the same 15 years to the coming years, are we going to have the same age or RDOs as we have in 2012? The answer is no. What proactive are we doing then in order the crop that is going to come or the crop that we want to produce to be able to have understanding or have a background of the history that we did or the problem that we had, no one has got an answer to the cause that we are here today. All that we are looking for or all that we are talking about, the blame uh, again. Secondly, let's look into the social uh, of the mining environment. Take Velcro. Take the PWV area. Take the influx control in Brasley Bay. No one talks about it. What about the, 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 for an example, all those people that were working into the gold mines, into the PWV area. The, the influx is in Brasley Bay. Is our system able to accommodate those people? We are not, we are not talking about that. What about the, 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 the informal structures? Are those people coming there into the informal settlement? Is the government going to be able to cater for them? We don't talk about it. What are our pro action that we put in place to say, in 10, 15 years time, these are the issues that are going to arise. What is it, or the, the, the plans that we can put in place to prevent such issues or things that happen now? Nothing. Let's go to the issue of the union aspect of it. I'm not gonna do the comparison in terms of what happened in 2012 as compared to the 30 years that NUM has engaged in terms of where we are now. But at the end, we keep on saying, NUM has lost all members because whatever initial 
uh, uh, sitting on the or, or on the table for for ADF. That is not the issue that we need to discuss. The issue that we need to discuss and look forward to it specifically on the basic of the 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 the, 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 the swaps being uh, the swap uh, organization as the aims of it is for us tomorrow or 10 15 years time we've been here this is how we move this is how to need to put in place to prevent it the engineers they usually talk about what we call planetary gears but in terms of what we are dealing with here at the moment i don't see or fit or feel those gears put it together in you know, for us as a nation to move forward. Um, I would appeal or I would like to hear that voice to say when I go out or when we go out here, we can be able to say our nation from Maragana, these were the causes that contributed to the fatal. From those causes we move. Take for an example in, in Valrhys at uh, 8088. We heard about, thank you, Mom, that's the last comment. We had about 150 people died. Then, then President Mandela said we need to, to start to have what we call today in terms of the Mineral Act, the, the, the Safety and Health Act. So why can't we have those initiatives? From the experience that we learned, we had, then we put measures in place to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right behind him. Tops right behind. Thank you, Chair. My name is Siswe Parati from the Chamber of Mines. Um, I would like to thank all the presenters for their interesting and enlightening presentations. And of course, uh, there's so much food for thought that has been raised for further research. Um, I would like to make a couple of comments uh, and raise a few questions directed to Andrea uh, pertaining to the comparison <laughs> of South Africa's mining industry to the New South Wales. Um, once again, thanks. I think your your argument around the interaction of social norms and formal rules I found it interesting. And of course, the the concept of the regulatory character. And perhaps let me start there. Um, you have the view that uh, South Africa's uh, regulatory character is more towards the fatalist, individualist. Uh, columns that you, you present the slide that you have those four um, areas of, of analyzing the, the, the regulatory space of, of, of uh, uh, the way the South African mining industry is dealing with the OHS uh, performance. Thanks to you actually for your research that you've done on the Changing Minds, uh, changing, uh, minds project um, uh, and I've been fortunate enough to, to be involved uh, with the implementation of those recommendations and, and some of the initiatives that have been taken by the industry stakeholders. Um, I would like to say the industry has actually made some significant strides when it comes to um, safety performance. Um, if you, if really you are up to date with our fatalities, uh, since 2003 there's been a downward trend and, and one can really attribute this to, to, to to the decisions that were made in 2003 when the industry stakeholders that being organized labor, government, and employers took the decision to, to reduce South Africa's annual fertility rates by 20%, uh, so the annual 20% reduction rate. And of course, um, that was based on um, how we really uh, fair compared to Australia, Canada, and, and, and the USA. So, those 2018 milestones have really paid dividends, you know, but we, um, of course the, 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 the number of fatalities still leave much to be desired for. So, um, so what I'm saying is, I would say there's been a move from, from being from categorized as, as, as being a fatalist uh, or individualist uh, uh, category as we pointed it out. So we're moving towards perhaps hierarchist uh, where really uh, complying with rules it's, it's what is, is most important and, and uh, hence the issue of, of changing the culture of safety the work I'm, I'm working on on culture transformation framework making sure that the leaders walk the talk the CEOs walk the talk but of course when it comes to stakeholder uh, relations when you look at the interactions between the industry and the DMR you know um, the issue of play you know the play culture 
a portion in play, I think we are still stuck there. So really, um, uh, I think there's so much that we can learn from the Australians. Uh, I think in my own work as well, I've been actually pondering on this issue. What is it that the Australians decide on national culture of safety? What is it that you, you seem to be getting right, you know, in terms of uh, making sure that um, you perform uh, better uh, uh, than South Africa? Well, I mean, the latest stats do show that in the coal sector, uh, uh, I'm about to finish this, um, our coal sector is comparatively to the US coal sector now. So that again is just another indication of how much uh, uh, um, improvement we've made. And of course, we do recognize the role played by the, by the NUM here, the trade unions. So, but just the questions now I would like to ask. Uh, there's some, two questions. I didn't hear you. I didn't hear you say anything about the skills profile. I mean, between South Africa and the New South Wales, perhaps you could share something about the skills profiles of, of the frontline mine workers. If you could say something about their educational professors to South Africa. And of course, the remuneration. If you could perhaps share some, some your thoughts on that. Thanks. I'm sorry for taking so much. Okay, short and sharp. Short. Yeah, short and concise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good afternoon. All. Uh, my name is Tandi, uh, trade union official. Uh, I've got some questions that were not answered yesterday, but it should be asked again. What kind of social clause do mining companies have? in terms of improvement of the local surroundings where they exist, in terms of employment percentage that is required in terms of the local where they are operating, and the power that is have, uh, it's, uh, it's like it's uh, held by the chiefs and the authorities that are existing at the local level, because uh, you'll find that always the blame is put to the chiefs what does the government say? And another thing, what kind of a role does the government play in terms of monitoring? Because some of the profits they come to they went they go to government. It doesn't go to the chiefs. Therefore, want to ch I, I want to check in terms of that role that is played by government. And another another thing, in terms of those agreements that are signed by the mines, when they leave after exploit uh, uh, they exploited uh, the resources. What is it that they are expected to do? Because now we've got a number of mines that are, uh, are, are just left there and you find that people are dying and because of the illegal mining. So I just want to check what does your research tell you? And, but the problem is there's no way where you say you called a group of maybe say 20 people of the workers where you're conducting your own research uh, that told you this. But you just give one uh, question and you put a blanket that it's as if it's the whole uh, situation in that in, in, in that uh, industry, meaning the mining. So uh, I just want you to respond in terms of the social cost. I think we'll be assisted there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We don't have time for more questions. We don't. It's now I'm going to give the panel a chance to respond, although I do recognize that a lot of these are not specifically questions to the panel, but opening up uh, and continuing uh, the debate that has been going on. I'm sorry, there are about six people who want to ask, so if I let one person ask a question, we'll run over time. So, last comments from the panel. Um, I think if we want to develop a, a politics, maybe uh, to need to get back to your point, we have to take these enclaves seriously and how they're constructed. I think the enclave is the social and political and market formation in the post-apartheid minerals energy complex. Um, and analyzing them in how they operate in space allows one to both resist, but it also allows you to expand those enclaves so that they can, can become spaces of inclusion. Um, yeah. I'm going to be very quick. Uh, Timmy, I agree with you, the need to predict, to look into the future, but, but the challenge I, my analysis presents is let's look into a different kind of future. What other mining methods might be appropriate? What other ways of constructing labour in the South African mining industry might be better 
for all sorts of different outcomes. So maybe it's not about how many rock driller operators and, and what's their you know what's their profile. It's what kinds of work is uh, is going to be done in the mining industry in the future in, in South Africa. Um, Siswe, you, that's a, that's a, we'd say in Australia that's a Dorothy Dix question because you knew the answer before you asked the question. The educational background of Australian mine workers is very high and um, Andres was worried about uh, mine workers in certain parts of South Africa earning more than academics. Every mine worker in Australia earns considerably more than every academic just about in Australia. Mine working, in, working in mines is extremely lucrative in Australia for all sorts of reasons. Uh, and Sandy, I'm very happy over lunch to talk to you about the, the requirements of rehabilitation in Australia. Um, and just to clarify, the research we did lots of interviews on mine sites and I was just pulling out some specific examples to illustrate themes that I wanted to raise today. So I'm sorry if I gave the impression that we didn't do extensive interviewing. Okay, uh, just to respond to the lad who, who raised an issue about uh, the dark, the use of the term dark side of uh, Insurgent citizenship. Uh, I must admit that this, this is a borrowed term. I, I, I borrowed, uh, borrowed it from Carl and, um, and others. But I, I still agree with you that uh, sometimes as researchers, uh, we, we may see uh, some, some things as corruption in, 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 in a community, whilst the people who live in that community do not see it as such uh, because of the local moral orders. So maybe I, I have to present it in a, in a more nuanced uh, way because I think throughout my, my research, I, I didn't get this until right at the end of my field work. Then I got to talk to a certain lady and then she told me that, do you know that there's a lot of corrupt activities happening here? And, and to me, these were kind of hidden transcripts, something that you would not hear uh, if, if, if you talk to the normal people in the, in the, in the community. So I think maybe I, I have to present it in a, in a, in a more nuanced way, but, but indeed there are such hidden transcripts that indicate that uh, community leaders are corrupt, community leaders are, are manipulating uh, the, the members of the community, CPF is, is violent, they engage in, in, in all sorts of violence, they engage in all these kangaroo courts where they punish people, where they beat up people, but if, if you ask people in a normal day, they won't tell you anything about that. So yeah, that's, that's, that's my point. Thanks, you know, actually a good way to end because it takes you back to that question of what kind of regulation uh, is good and what kind we, is the kind we don't want. Um, so thank you very much to the panelists and thank you everybody. Uh, there is only a 45 minute lunch I'm told, so I'm sure you all need a, a break and a different way of uh, communicating. Uh, just to say also that I have some lost property here, a cell phone, a wallet and a pair of uh, glasses. So, if anybody's lost these items, please come and get it from them. I wrote that labor studies in South Africa was in decline. I think we ought to have invited him along to, uh, to, to this session, uh, this, this day, and the crowds of people here. Um, SWAT began 30 years ago looking at the mines, and it's great um, to see that it's back where it started, uh, although, of course, not on gold but platinum. And we have three uh, very interesting papers we presented uh, this afternoon. The first, I think I'll take it from my, from from my from here, done by Moody, uh, who is a, a visiting uh, professor in in Swap, and uh, is well known for his work on the mining industry going back uh, nearly 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, Luke uh, Sunwell, a senior researcher from the University of uh, Johannesburg, who will be talking on the worker committee. And then uh, thirdly, uh, we have um, Crispin, uh, who's uh, uh, a, an ex-train driver from Zimbabwe. Uh, Crispin Chinguna uh, is currently a, a PhD fellow in uh, SWAP, uh, completing a search on Marikana. So we, we have a, a group of speakers who have inside knowledge. Over to you, Dunbar. Okay. Um, let, let, me, let me start 
by saying that um, I'm, I'm going to be addressing uh, uh, questions of uh, labor organization, particularly on the platinum mines. For the, la for the past, oh, I don't know, 15, 17, 18 years or something, since 1995, I believe, I've been interviewing members of the NUM and trying to understand the history of the NUM and the rise of the NUM. And <clears throat> there's a big question mark over the NUM uh, in Rustenburg and on the platinum mines. And uh, 